In 1977, the die-hard football fans of Denver, Colorado poured into remodeled Mile High Stadium for another year of Bronco football. For 18 seasons, Bronco fans were given promises. In 1977, Denver was delivered a champion. they could do it. But when the chips were finally counted, Denver had unseated a world champion and had had the season Bronco fans have been waiting for for nearly two decades. At the age of 34, Craig Morton arrived in Denver. Two painful years in New York had cast a shadow on Morton's ability to win. But the heartache of New York was behind him. In Denver, his new teammates made him welcome. He became the starting quarterback and he found new peace of mind in religion, all of which contributed to the Craig Morton revival. The veteran quarterback developed a new image. He didn't tell his teammates when he was going to run. He just took off. At 34, Morton rushed for some pretty important touchdowns and threw a whole lot more. His comeback was a smashing success. And Craig Morton owed a debt of gratitude to the man who made it all possible. Red Miller is probably one of the finest men that I've ever known and a tremendous coach and he's just a joy to play for. He's a real fair man, he's, he enjoys the game, he lets people have fun, yet uh, they know how to work for him too and it's great to be in a situation like that. Red Miller inherited a good football team. He told them they could be champions. And when Red Miller talks, people listen. Offensive linemen Montler, Miner, Maurer, Glassick, and Howard listen. The pass protection improved, and suddenly Denver had an air game. In recent years, the Broncos have come to count on their defense. In 77, the Orange Crush looked better than ever. Denver knocked its first four opponents silly and coasted into October undefeated. Could the Broncos really be champions? Denver went on the road to find out. To be a champion, you first must beat one. And the Orange Crush had a game plan for the Oakland Raiders. Step one, stop Oakland from running to the left. Step two, put a little heat on the snake. Even a quarterback of Ken Stabler's ability can't win a football game on the seat of his pants. 
take away his ground game, force him out of the pocket, and Stabler is just another quarterback. Denver picked off seven Ken Stabler passes, three alone by number 59, Joe Rizzo. More interceptions than Stabler usually throws in a month. Stabler in the end zone, rolling to his right, looking a flag down as the pass is intercepted at the 15. Return for a touchdown by Lewis Wright. There was a flag in the end zone, which may be holding. Lewis Wright in the end zone as he picked that ball off on the near sidelines, near the 20-yard line, and the Broncos have scored. Could Craig Morton and the offense hold up their end? And it's Perrin starting to the right. He is at the 15. He's at the 5. He'll score! Lonnie Perrin on a 17-yard run. He just scooted around the right end and in, and the Broncos take the lead. Morton is back. He's 2 for 3. He's looking, steps to the side, throws the pass. Touchdown, Riley Odom! A 10-yard touchdown pass. Craig Morton to Riley Odom. 42-yard try by Turner. Ball is down. It's a fake. Weiss looking, throwing. Turner wide open. Catches the ball at the 15. He'll score a touchdown. The grand old man has done it. And it's never The Denver Broncos overpowered the Oakland Raiders, knocked them from the ranks of the unbeaten, and took sole possession of first place in the AFC Western Division. Just maybe the Broncos could be champions. After Denver beat the Raiders, a trip to Mile High Stadium would never be quite the same. Getting in to see the Broncos brought out the con artist in everybody. Some folks tried clever disguises to get inside. And sure enough, every now and then, one of them would slip through. Yes, sir, anybody old enough to wear pants could see that something most unusual was happening here in Denver. The locals had a name for it, Broncomania. What began as a love affair with Denver's defense mushroomed into a social epidemic. dress for a Broncos game included something orange. If you didn't have it on when you got there, you'd better get it on before kickoff. doubt about it, Denver, Colorado was in love with its football team. Would the Broncos ever lose again? Why, out here in the West, them's fighting words. Denver fans led the league in decibels, and the Broncos led the NFL in total attendance. In week seven, another capacity crowd was on hand to welcome home their undefeated team.
Unfortunately, Broncomania also had its enemies. Oakland took its revenge, and Broncomania was shot down in mid-flight. The AFC West was now a two-team race, and the smart money said the Broncos would be the first team to fade. The schedule was one of the league's toughest. Could the Broncos really be champions? The time had come to see what this team was made of. Time for the big push. Every unit was expected to contribute. Every unit did. The special teams contributed Rick Upchurch, whose 1977 punt return yardage was the second highest single season total in league history, and whose 167 yard performance in week eight erased the Pittsburgh Steelers. Veteran Jim Turner and rookie Bucky Diltz handled the kicking. And bomb squatters Schultz, Maples, Hyde, Payne, Egloff, Schindler, Turk, and Jensen had to hustle. Otherwise, their services might not be needed. The defense also rallied. The league's top quarterbacks took their best shots. But the secondary of Foley, Wright, newcomer Bernard Jackson, and Captain Bill Thompson, number 36, was equal to every challenge. Linebackers Swenson, Bradishar, Rizzo, and number 57, Tom Jackson, supplemented the pass rush. But Chavis, Manor, Carter, Smith, Grant, and Alzado didn't need a whole lot of help. Five Bronco defenders made all pro and the rest deserved at least honorable mention. The big push had the Broncos thinking like champions. A fourth down pass with less than two minutes to play was the clincher in San Diego. A last second goal line stand preserved a 14 to seven win in Kansas City. If the game was close going into period four, Denver found a way to win it. The Broncos breezed through November with four consecutive wins, and their 11-1 record was the best in football. One more win, and the Broncos would be in the playoffs. But by now, Denver's growing reputation was preceding them into every foreign stadium. No longer could the Broncos sneak up on unsuspecting foes. That final win was going to be a tough one to get, but the big push needed it to be a success. was everybody's choice for NFL Coach of the Year because his big push had gotten the Broncos into the playoffs. Later that night, the Broncos returned home. When they left Houston, they were assured of at least the wild card berth in the playoffs. 
When they arrived in Denver, the LA Rams had just beaten the Oakland Raiders. The Denver Broncos were the new AFC Western Division champions. from Mile High Stadium in Denver. This is Bob Martin with Larry Zimmer as the Denver Broncos meet the Pittsburgh Steelers. The first time in the history of the Bronco franchise they have ever been in a playoff game. The Broncos sport the best record in the AFC, but it means nothing now as they go against the 9-5 Steelers, the first time Denver has ever played this close to Christmas. Afternoon became evening, but as the Rocky Mountain campfires were lit, the game still had not been resolved. Time now for true champions to assert themselves. Tom Jackson's two fourth quarter interceptions were nice, but Red Miller warned his club that their slim lead was vulnerable, and the playoff season Steelers were aching for another chance. Only one obstacle remained in Denver's path to the Super Bowl. The AFC Championship was on the line, and the Orange Crush knew exactly what they had to do. The Raiders went nowhere on the ground and each of Ken Stabler's receivers was finding life difficult. Second year cornerback Steve Foley buried Cliff Branch. Gratishar and company punished Fred Bulletnikoff. And Bob Swenson wore tight end Dave Casper like an overcoat. The offense seized the initiative. Craig Morton's first completion of the day went to Haven Moses as Denver took a 7-3 first quarter lead. Then early in period four, the M&M connection struck for the clincher. Suddenly, Super Bowl dreams were close at hand. Get down, Denver. Go on to the Super Bowl. We're all going to the Super Bowl. Hey! Hey! New Orleans, here we come. Here we come. Woo! 
But New Orleans was still one long quarter away, and the Broncos dug in for the onslaught. Broncos needed only one more first down to run out the clock. Come back! Come on now! Hold on to the ball! This organization has been down for a long time. The Denver Broncos are now earning the respect of the entire league, and that's what we want. We want to be known as a good team, as a good football team, which we are. And we're going to go on from here, we hope. On to New Orleans for Super Bowl XII. In 1977, the Dallas Cowboys were the best team in professional football. Denver was number two. But one disappointing evening in New Orleans does not tarnish a season of unbounded success. Never forget. A rookie head coach told you to think like winners. And so you told a defending champion you were going to take away his title. Then you went out and did it. Thank you, Denver Broncos. Thank you for a championship season. Super Bowl XII, the Denver Broncos couldn't catch a break. Each time opportunity presented itself, the Broncos let it slip away. Ah! 
The Dallas Cowboys scored two long second half touchdowns to win. And on both occasions, their margin of success was a matter of inches. A matter of inches. The Broncos won 14 games en route to the Super Bowl, including playoff wins over Pittsburgh and Oakland. But in the eyes of the critics, losing to the Cowboys made it all insignificant. The Broncos were branded one-year wonders, a team that would vanish from the playoff scene as quickly as they'd come upon it. And so, as the 78 season began, most football experts agreed that Oakland would regain the Western Division crown and that Denver would slip quietly into oblivion. But Red Miller's team proved the experts wrong. For instead of regressing, the Broncos won seven of eight games in pro football's strongest division. And at season's end, they once again reigned as its champion. Anybody who thought that Bronco Mania died the night of Super Bowl XII was sadly mistaken. dramatic way to begin their title defense than against the team the experts said would take that title away. As usual, the matchup had all the grace of guerrilla warfare. The one dominant force was Denver's defense, which gave the Raiders no avenue of escape. A scoreless first half went down to the final minute before the Broncos rolled a seven. 17 seconds. Horton lobs the ball for Moses. Touchdown! The m, &M connection and the Broncos lead six to nothing. Then midway through period four, the defense snuffed out Oakland's last hope. Staber to throw, looking to the left, looking some more, throwing it up the middle. Caught intercepted, picked up by Bernard Jackson, 50-40, coming left. He is at the 35, still on his feet, out of bounds at the 30. Denver won handily, and the mighty Raider offense couldn't score a touchdown. A splendid beginning to the 1978 season. But Denver's defensive dominance of the Raiders was no more than Bronco fans have come to expect. In 1978, only Pittsburgh allowed fewer points, and no defense dealt out more punishment. Like all great defenses, the Broncos don't often let running backs turn the corner. Denver's defenders usually arrive in waves, but sometimes one all-pro can do the job all by himself. Number 20 is all-pro cornerback Lewis Wright, a rare blend of savvy and tough. 
strong enough to stop Walter Payton Cole, yet quick enough to outrun everybody to the football. He's as tough to beat deep as he is to beat on the corner, a quality his teammates share with him. For in 1978, only Miami intercepted more passes. And nobody permitted fewer touchdowns through the air than the Broncos. In front of every good secondary is a strong defensive line. And strong is the word for number 72, Don Latimer, Denver's first round pick in the 78 draft. Latimer's outstanding rookie season prompted Denver to experiment with a four-man line. And it added quality depth to a unit that includes number 66, Bryson Manor, and number 63, John Grant. Anchoring the three-man front was number 68, Reuben Carter, perhaps the NFL's best nose guard, and certainly the only one who has ever appeared on the cover of Sports Illustrated. From the outside comes the pass rush of ends Barney Chavis and, of course, all-pro Lyle Alzado, number 77. Alzado is Denver's tough guy, a hard-nosed veteran from Brooklyn who is both backstreet tough and cat burglar quick. But even Alzado doesn't invade a pass pocket as quickly as all-pro linebacker Tom Jackson. Jackson gives flair to an exceptional group of linebackers who epitomize the word unit. Sometimes they're a defense unto themselves. Jackson pressuring the passer. Joe Rizzo forcing a fumble. Randy Gratishar adding a lick and number 51, Bob Swenson, completing the operation. The key man in the unit is Randy Gratishaw, proclaimed by many to be the finest inside linebacker in the game. In 1978, he was everybody's all-pro, and yet he was very rarely this visible. For as Gratishar explains on the Broncos, it's easy to get lost in the crowd. If you watch any of our films, you'll always see anywhere from eight to nine to ten people around the football, and that includes secondary and defensive line and the linebackers. We don't have real big linemen. We have very small linebackers, and when you don't have the size, you have to compensate with something else, and we've compensated with our speed and our quickness. We all get to the ball, and that's why teams have a hard time getting outside on us. Such was the case in Kansas City. In week four, the Chiefs trotted through all sorts of pre-snap exercises. But when they finally put the ball in play, Denver's linebackers ran it down. Against San Diego, still another defensive pro bowler put some lumps on the Chargers. Number 36, Bill Thompson laid waste to the league's best air game, clearing the stage for the league's premier punt return. And Rick Upchurch provided Denver with its winning points. Through the season's first seven weeks, Denver's rugged defense allowed only eight touchdowns and 86 points. In five of those weeks, the offense punched across enough points to win. These were good times in Denver. Bronco mania was alive and well, and Denver was five and two, tied for first in the AFC West. Throughout the 78 season, Denver's designated starting quarterback was veteran Craig Morton. Though the focal point of considerable criticism, Morton, given good protection, could lay it out for six as well as anybody. Morton, however, did have his off days, and Red Miller didn't hesitate to substitute. 
Against Seattle, number 14, Norris Weiss tossed a scoring pass to running back John Keyworth at one end of Mile High Stadium, while at the other end, number 12, Craig Penrose lofted one to running back Dave Preston. Preston is one of six Denver running backs who saw duty, for Red Miller substituted freely in the backfield as well. Preston, Keyworth, Larry Canada, Lonnie Perrin, Otis Armstrong, and Rob Lytle gave Denver a consistent and versatile attack. When the blocking was good, each could pick his way through the hole and power it in for the score. But when the hole was clogged, each could swing outside, as Preston did in overtime to beat Kansas City. In the pass catching department, Rick Upchurch and Jack Dalvin split time at one wide receiving position, while veteran deep threat Haven Moses, number 25, held down the other. But the most potent weapon in Denver's arsenal was Pro Bowl tight end Riley Odoms. Some of the NFL's finest athletes play tight end, but in 1978, only Dave Casper caught more passes, gained more yardage, and scored more touchdowns than Riley Odoms. He was Denver's busiest receiver with 54 catches, the main man in a rotating 15-man group of skilled players that could do no wrong in Mile High Stadium. But when the Broncos donned visitors white, their fortunes took a turn for the worse. Away from home, Denver learned why champions always say it's easier to get to the top than it is to stay there. Defending champions expect to be treated rudely. But being ready to take an opponent's best shot doesn't always soften the impact. In a difficult mid-season stretch, teams the Broncos should have dominated were getting the best of them. In Baltimore, a blocked field goal cost the Broncos a win. In Seattle, offensive uncertainty nearly cost them another. Denver's confidence was shaky, and only one man knew a remedy. Red Miller awakened his club with some good old-fashioned hell raising, and Denver turned things around in Seattle. Steve Foley's interception in overtime set up a game-winning field goal as Denver averted a major upset. The following week in Mile High, they attempted to settle the matter early, jumping out to a 28-7 lead over the Jets. But just when things seemed to be coming together, it was the defense that fell apart. Frustration set in as disturbed Denver fans watched a 21-point lead disappear. Back to pass on first down, throwing it long for Walker. And he's got it on the run at the 30 and will score! Boy, oh boy, oh boy. New York scored 24 unanswered points in a shocking come-from-behind win. If the Broncos were to avoid being one-year wonders, they would need a shot of adrenaline. All right, now let's go to work. Everybody work hard now. Everybody work hard now. 
Hey, everybody work hard now. Let's go. By the time Thanksgiving Day arrived in Detroit, Red Miller's inspirational presence had lifted Denver to wins over Cleveland and Green Bay. At this point in the season, every play was crucial. Big down now, big down. That away, Rizzo! That away, defense! That a baby! Long time in the huddle. Long time in the huddle. Hey, Bernie! Long time in the huddle to watch play action. Drop the ball. Drop the ball one time. By the fourth quarter, Denver had run out of defense. Fumble, fumble, fumble. Fumble, fumble! This place is you in next week's game, then it becomes even more critical with Oakland. Right. You want me to comment on that? Sure. There, it's, it boils down to one game. But we knew we'd be in a dogfight all the way, so it doesn't change much. Every week is the same thing. Of course, this puts us in jeopardy now. Somehow, Red Miller's term, jeopardy, seemed a rather mild description of Denver's predicament. Hey, Broncos! You see this? You see this? This is what you're gonna get tonight! Hey, Martin, you, hey, Martin, you hear me, Martin? Hey, Martin, you hear me? Yeah, you hear me. You got yours tonight, Martin. Through the first period and a half, Oakland's prophets of doom were right. Denver was catching hell at both ends of every offensive play. Then, midway through period two, a bit of casual abuse proved to be the turning point of the contest. Little Rick Upchurch would not be intimidated, and the Broncos rallied. While Oakland stood around and fumed, number 41, Rob Lytle, gave Denver the lead. Then Denver's defense dug in to protect it. The Raiders had hoped they wouldn't fall behind, for they knew they would be playing right into Denver's hands. And so they were, for when it really counts, good defenses don't allow comebacks. Oakland never threatened again. For the second time in 78, the Broncos did not allow the Raiders a touchdown. On another front, Ray Guy suffered only the third block punt of his career. A tribute to the efforts of Godwin Turk, Glenn Hyde, Maurice Harvey, Bobby Maples, Rob Nairn, and Larry Evans, among others, on the Broncos special teams. But the biggest play of all came from the defense. Tom hands the ball to Van Egan, fumble, picked up by the Bronco. Bronco recovering, here comes Gratishar. Ten, five, goal line, Gratishar recovers the touchdown and scores. It's number 20, Oakland 6, 637 to go, and there are a few Bronco fans in the crowd. Yes, there were Bronco fans in Oakland, and they couldn't have been happy. Mission Impossible had been successfully completed and the Broncos left California to a standing ovation, all alone atop the AFC Western Division. The temperature was in the 20s the following week in Mile High. 
but Bronco fans were oblivious to everything except their team's chances of clinching the division title. Denver's defense turned in its customary strong performance, and Kansas City's potent wing T all but disappeared. The Broncos, meanwhile, had no such problems. The mailman, number 35, Larry Canada, broke off Denver's longest run of the season as the Broncos' ground game powered through the Chiefs. At one point, Craig Morton hit 16 consecutive passes, while Riley Odoms had his best day ever as Denver won going away. It was a moment worthy of celebration. After 15 grueling weeks, the team the experts had written off was a champion once more. Red Miller's Denver Broncos returned to the playoffs in 1978. And although they lost to Pittsburgh in the opening round, the important thing is they got there. One-year wonders they were not. Two-time champions they are. Under a veil of azure blue lies the city of Denver, a place so magnificent that folks there appear to have the world on a string. While the whims of Mother Nature may change, the quality of Denver living never goes downhill. Yet even life in the Rockies can get a little rocky. And on such unfortunate occasions, there's a guiding light that lifts each and every Colorado spirit. Mile High Stadium, home of the Denver Broncos and of 72 consecutive sellout crowds. In 1979, once again, Orange Hysteria invaded the Midwest as the Broncos became one of only four elite NFL teams to earn a playoff berth in each of the last three seasons. Fans witnessed unparalleled defensive performances throughout the year and were treated to moments of brilliance by the steadily improving Denver offense. Unfortunately, the level of excellence of the defense was unequaled by the Bronco point scoring unit, a discrepancy made painfully clear in the season's finale in San Diego. At stake, the championship of the AFC West, a game viewed by Monday Night Million. Quarterback Dan Fouts and the explosive Chargers were held in check throughout much of the evening, but into the third quarter, lightning struck. First down at the Bronco 32-yard line. Fouts going back. He fakes. Swenson on the blitz. Fouts gets rid of the ball. On the way to Joyner. He is wide open at the two-yard line and scores. And the San Diego Chargers lead 13-7. Comeback efforts by Craig Morton were in vain as victory and the division championship were in the hands of San Diego. Denver's two-year reign as rulers of the West had come to an end, 17 to 7. Morton knew all too well they would have to score more than a touchdown to defeat Houston in the playoffs. Early on, Denver's scoring force played with a new resolve. 
Broncos started at their own 20. Now it's third and goal at the Oilers' seven. Morton back. Here comes the pressure. The pass is for Dave Preston, complete at the three-yard line. He cuts back inside, hit at the goal line. He scores. Touchdown by Dave Preston. Second effort, getting him across the goal line, and the Broncos lead. Bronco enforcers took the field, vowing to prove that the D emblazoned on their helmets also signified defense. Secondary men Steve Foley and Bill Thompson were but two of the tenacious pass defenders, frustrating quarterback Dan Pastorini's efforts to gain the lead. But again, Denver's lone touchdown would not stand up, as Houston managed a hard-fought 13-7 decision. Again, the uh, T formation with Wilson in motion, and it is to Campbell to the goal line, touchdown! in the end zone, but they had already signaled touchdown. Coach Red Miller's men saw their outstanding 10-6 season prematurely ended. Yet Miller is a determined man, a man who eyes the future with a stoic confidence. He and his men eye the coming decade with a purpose. That purpose, to return to the playoffs for the fourth consecutive time. They eagerly await the countdown to the new season with a firm commitment. In 1980, the Denver Broncos will be a force yearning to excel. They usher in the 80s as a force with a commitment to excellence. Commitment to excellence has long been the credo of Denver's dominating defense. 1979 was no exception. In the season opener against the unpredictable Bengals, Joel Collier's defense was unyielding, shutting out Cincinnati well into the fourth quarter. With a first and goal at the Bronco 10, three times the visitors were turned away. Backed against the wall, one final moment of might would preserve the fragile goose egg and a 10 to nothing victory. Lewis Wright and Bernard Jackson quickly sealed off the flank, and the Denver defense was off to a remarkable season-long campaign. They had made their stand in week one and would continue to do so in the showdowns to come. A wise old sage once stated that the best offense is a good defense. Quite simply, Denver's defense is an offense. A group of ever-shifting gap shooters, the unit molded by Stan Jones, Bob Zeman, and Richie McCabe, scored five touchdowns in 1979. Most responsible for the Broncos' uncanny ability to score without the ball was number 51, Bob Swenson. In 1979, Swenson was second only to Randy Gratishar as the team leader in tackles and assists, while pacing the team with four fumble recoveries. For his outstanding defensive play, Swenson received the prestigious Earl Hartman Award. Swenson is a member of what many believe to be the finest linebacking corps in the entire National Football League. The heart and soul of Denver's cap-quick linebacking unit, All-Pro Randy Gratishar, number 53, and fellow All-Pro Lewis Wright, pulled off yet another scoring shuffle in 1979. Stocked with enough Pro Bowl starters to hold their own postseason classic, the Denver defense and Pro Bowl-bound Tom Jackson, number 57, made the big play seem commonplace. Aiding the defensive onslaught were Reuben Carter, number 68, Bryson Manor, Don Latimer, Marnie Chavis, Joe Rizzo, Larry Evans, and number 58, Rob Nair. All told, the Bronco defense proved they could at times move the football better than many NFL offenses. Number one against the touchdown pass, and number one versus the run. A unit that embodied the word defense. 
synonymous with the term defense is the name Gratishar. How would you like to compete against four-time All-Pro linebacker Randy Gratishar, perhaps the NFL's best? Three linebacker drop. Three backer drop. Right, right. the field, Gratishar is an introspective, soft-spoken individual who shuns conflict and argument. But when Randy becomes number 53, he undergoes a vital metamorphosis. You don't push me off! No, no, no! Just catch the ball! You don't push me off with your foot! Call the ball, you little kick! We'll call it. After most storms, there's a calm. But with Gratishar, there's still one more thunderous crash. <laughs> Randy Gratishar. One reason why in 1979, the Broncos were the toughest team to run against in the entire NFL. Yet occasionally, even the best falter, as was the case when the dynamic Seattle Seahawks blew into mile high and apparently had blown apart the Bronco defense. But this was to be a miraculous Sunday on the NFL's fourth week as Craig Morton, Denver's most valuable offensive player, opened the floodgates on Seattle. Second and goal at the two. Jensen and Armstrong now, and Morton rolling to his right, looking, throwing, touchdown! First down, Lytle and Jensen continue as the running backs. Morton throwing it quickly for Moses. Touchdown, David Moses! And the Broncos have scored two quick ones and are right back in business. Moses left, up church right. Morton straight back, pumping it once, throwing the pass for Upchurch, he'll have to hurry. He's got it for the Morton pumped back and then threw as Upchurch broke loose inside the 15. Touchdown! Third and goal at the one. Vital cuts to the right and scores in the Broncos lead. Denver 37-34, Rob Vital. Morton and all of Denver's offensive weapons had fostered a dramatic victory. Red Miller's club had embarked on a mid-season streak that would see them scatter seven of their next nine foes, including a key victory in Kansas City's Arrowhead Stadium. Tied for first, the Chiefs and Broncos collided for possession of the top notch in the AFC West. Given less than an affectionate greeting, the Denver defense had prepared a little greeting of its own. Clearly the Broncos would separate a first place team from a team who wished to be. Come on, come on! We say oh! Go get it! Double coverage proved no match for the elusive Rick Upchurch. And when Craig Morton found proven veteran Haven Moses with but one man to beat, the result was inevitable. When the m and &M connection clicked once more, the Broncos were 24 to 10 winners. Branded as inconsistent, Denver's offense had silenced the critics demonstrating they too are prepared to join in the Broncos commitment to excellence. For the first time in the team's history, Denver gained over 5,000 yards in a season. 
Largely responsible were guard Tom Glassick and the young, improving offensive line of Whitey Devell. One of the league's premier guards, Glassick found the road to success a rough one. Basically, last year my problem was I went to Cleveland, and I'm still not sure whether I got sick of Cleveland or was sick from Cleveland or in Cleveland, but I went to the hospital for a week and lost 30 pounds with some kind of a stomach virus. Some good home cooking from Tom's sister Marion helped bolster Glassick's size and strength. In good health, Glassick now has time to devote to his unique interest, military history. I am a great admirer of Napoleon. Napoleon not only commanded his army, he made his army. Uh, they weren't loyal to France, they were loyal to Napoleon. He was an autonomous commander, he was an autonomous ruler, he was able to do whatever he wanted to. He forged his old guard as his personal bodyguard and they grew to a force of almost 50,000 men. Certainly Red Miller is not Napoleon and his force does not amount to 50,000. But his offensive line of Glassick, Paul Howard, Claudie Miner, and number 64, Bill Bryan, along with linemate Dave Stuttered, comprise a front line that was the most improved aspect of the 79 Broncos. Chris Blocks allowed Denver to overcome the 49ers near season's end. And blanket protection gave Morton time to find Otis Armstrong securing victory. Armstrong not only performed well against San Francisco, but was the best Bronco back in 1979, closing in on 4,000 career yards. As well, John Keyworth, Dave Preston, Rob Lytle, Larry Canada, and Jim Jensen were a reliable pack of determined runners under the guidance of backfield coach Paul Roach. Jensen typifies the Denver Rushers, stubborn, bullish, and ready to join in the commitment for continued improvement. Through the air, the Broncos had more success under coach Fran Polesfoot than ever before in their 20-year history. Riley Odoms continued to shine in 1979 and has emerged as one of the most powerful and consistent tight ends in football. While Odoms relied on brute strength in gaining yardage, crafty veteran Haven Moses used his sprinter speed and agility to enjoy by far the best season of his 12-year pro career. When it comes to snaring footballs, dodging defensive backs, and scoring touchdowns, keep your eye on number 80 if you can. The man who sports that numeral is Rick Upchurch, who in his first season as a starter proved to be more elusive than a greased 747. He's faster than a yellow jacket, and he can catch anything that doesn't sting. Upchurch became the greatest punt returner in NFL history last season, but now he saves his speed for pass routes. Secondary men beware, and keep your eye on number 80. Trigger man for the Broncos, Craig Morton posted career highs in attempts, completions, yardage, and completion percentage in 1979. He shared time with Norris Weiss, who led Denver to three early season wins. While Morton proved most effective as a passer, Weiss ignited the club with his running. But in 1980, Denver will have a man who can do both very well. Matt Robinson, a three-year veteran with the Jets, joined the Broncos in the offseason. Robinson is not a new name to Denver fans, 
Airport. Two short years ago, Robinson and his Jets were in town only to be terribly outplayed in the first half of what was to be a mile-high thriller. In the final 30 minutes, Matt Robinson played exceptionally as he guided an upset come-from-behind victory on Denver's home turf. When Robinson hit Wesley Walker, his Jets were winners. But now as a Bronco, he must be prepared to learn under newly hired offensive coordinator Rob Dauhauer to advance the commitment in the coming season. In 1979, it was time to give a great big hand to a 16-year veteran known for his big toe. Ole High Tops, Jim Turner became only the second man in pro football history to kick 300 field goals. Only George Blanda has scored more points. Twice, Turner's accuracy brought victory last season, including a dramatic overtime win against Atlanta. Ball is down, Turner's kick on the way. Good, the Broncos win! Jim Turner has just put the Broncos in the locker room with a win in overtime. And the Broncos win it 20 to 17. While outstanding individual achievement certainly has its place in the game, Bronco fans have come to expect nothing short of a total team effort in Mile High Stadium. Indeed, consummate play will be required if the Broncos are to achieve their destiny in the 80s. On Sunday, November 11th, the tough New England Patriots discover just how mighty the Denver team can be. An inspired Denver defense produced more turnovers than an all-night bakery. Before the Patriots could manage a single first down, the Broncos scored 24 points. This was a Sunday that head coaches dream about. Miller's men scored at will through the air. And with grim determination, Marv Braden's special team standout Larry Canada powered over Lane. Fifteen minutes into the game, the route was on. Then the snow came. Like the snow, Denver's defense came from nowhere and it stuck. Whether general by Norris Weiss or veteran Craig Morton, Denver's army was an unstoppable force. Fred Miller's 45-man roster had mastered an excellent football team under the worst of conditions. They had transformed their commitment onto the playing field. When the final seconds of the 1980 season are ticked off, Bronco fans and the entire National Football League will have been served notice that the Denver Bronco Football Club is a team with a commitment. A commitment to excellence. In 1984, the Denver Broncos were a team together as they marched to their third AFC Western Division title. With a roster that included 21 first or second year players, the Broncos celebrated their 25th anniversary season in professional football under the guidance of new owner Patrick D. Bolin. With leadership provided by Coach of the Year Dan Reeves, 
This very special team of talented veterans and up-and-coming stars had all the right stuff on way to their fifth playoff appearance. Under a bright blue Rocky Mountain sky, a very sure and mature John Elway led the Broncos' offensive attack against AFC rival Pittsburgh. On this day of big plays, wide receiver Steve Watson ran up 177 yards receiving. And Elway connected for two touchdowns to Watson and H-back Jim Wright. foundation for the Broncos' success in 1984 was built around an opportunistic bend-but-don't-break defensive unit. Against the Steelers, youngsters Ricky Hunley and Roger Jackson worked the special teams, while the rest of the ball-hawking Broncos were in constant pursuit to make the big play. season, Denver had lived by the turnover. Now, with time running out in the game, Denver owner Pat Bolin watched his Broncos suffer the biggest turnover of all. Elway takes it back to the 15-yard line. Pass is intercepted at the 30-yard line. Picked off by Eric Williams, and he's still running. Broncos' call to glory had come to an abrupt end. But what had sustained the Broncos through this championship season was the togetherness they had attained as a young, tough, and talented team. And it was this togetherness that brought the Broncos the winning of the West. The story of how the West was won began with a solid front office. President Pat Bolin teamed with executive John Beek and coach Dan Reeves to construct a solid foundation on which the Broncos were built. In a season in which the Broncos tied or broke 13 team records, the defense was the most celebrated unit. The Bronco defense finished second only to San Francisco in touchdowns allowed and forced 55 turnovers. And from the very first week of the regular season, the defense served notice that when you ventured into Denver territory, you were in danger of losing not only the ball, but the game. Against Cincinnati, linebacker Carl Mecklenburg was one of the Broncos' leading hitmen. While the defense outmuscled the Bengals, the Broncos' offense shifted into high gear. Behind the veteran offensive line of Billy Bryan, Paul Howard, Keith Bishop, Dave Studdard, and Ken Lanier, the Broncos' young running backs were led by number 23, Sammy Winder. And when the line wasn't opening up the running lanes, they were providing Elway with time to find open airways. acquired Butch Johnson moonwalked his way to 56 yards receiving. And when Elway suffered a bruised shoulder, backup Gary Kubiak came in and found rookie tight end Clarence K for the winning score. K's eight-yard grab capped off the 20-17 opening day win. After being shut out in Chicago, the Broncos regrouped for a special Sunday night game with the Browns. Winder ran up 76 yards on the ground and hauled in 56 more behind the wall of Howard, Bryan, and Bishop. After the Browns put 14 points on the board, the Broncos' offense answered with 17 of their own. Elway hit Butch Johnson and second-year man Clint Sampson for two second-quarter scores. A 
each Carlos field goal gave the Broncos a lead they never relinquished. But the real damage was done by the defense as they registered a season-high seven sacks and pulled down three interceptions. Dennis Smith and Steve Wilson, number 45, each stole one. But the biggest theft of all came with only seconds to play. 50 seconds left. McDonald at his 45, throwing. It's intercepted. 40, 45, 50. Robbins at the 40. He'll return it for a touchdown. Rookie Randy Robbins' 62-yard interception gave Denver a 24-14 victory and sent the Broncos home where this football-crazy city's love affair with its most enduring symbol of civic pride was again in full bloom. When special teams coach Fran Polesfoot became ill, the fans responded with an outpouring of affection. And in week four's contest with Kansas City, Polesfoot's former group set the tone for the contest. Special teamers John Sawyer, Tony Lilly, Aaron Smith, Don Summers, Roger Jackson, Chris Brewer, and Mike Freeman were led by MVP wheel horse Ken Woodard, number 52. Rookie putter Chris Norman made a fine first-year impression with a 62-yard punt. One 83-yard blast that was the longest in Bronco history. With Norman's record-setting punts keeping Kansas City backed up, the Bronco offense put the Chiefs away. The offensive line opened big holes for Gerald Wilhite, number 47, Sammy Winder and Rick Paris, whose combined efforts averaged nearly six yards per rush. With guard Paul Howard executing the perfect trap, the Bronco back slipped through for two touchdowns. The Denver defense established a new Bronco record by allowing the Chiefs only 50 yards rushing. Cornerback Mike Harden's 45-yard interception capped off the Bronco shutout of the Chiefs. In Week 5's matchup with the L.A. Raiders, the defense again made the big plays that led the Broncos to victory. Assistant head coach Joe Collier devised a defensive game plan that shut down the Raiders. Premier outside linebacker Tom Jackson was the leader of this high-powered unit that pounded the defending Super Bowl champions and left them gasping for lungfuls of the thin Colorado air. The Broncos' tough 16-13 victory established Reeves as unique among NFL coaches. He has never lost to a defending Super Bowl champ in his four years as a head coach. Reeves' successful game plan was again in focus against the Lions, where the Broncos combined a high-flying offensive attack with an unrelenting defense. The Broncos won their fourth straight behind the scoring combination of Elway to Watson. Watson hauled in 111 of Elway's 210 passing yards. While on the ground, the march continued with the Broncos' parade of tailbacks. Sammy Winder flew in for six of the Broncos' 28 points. While cornerback Louis Wright set the tone of the defense by forcing a first quarter fumble. Mecklenburg, Ruland Jones, Dennis Smith, Steve Wilson, Tony Lilly, Darren Como, Barney Chavis, Steve Busick, number 58, and Ken Woodard, number 52, performed the perfect tricks that made the Lions all but disappear. For the day, the defense intercepted seven passes and scored twice. And this avalanche of turnovers created by the defense continued in a Monday night contest the following week. Get your mind off the weather. Get your mind on your business. Play ball. Ah! On a night that wasn't fit for man or beast, the Broncos beat back the elements and beat up the Packers. After the Broncos won the toss, Coach Reeves elected to kick off, forcing Green Bay to handle the ball first in snow-swept Mile High Stadium. Normal, normal, normal room! Packers will start moving from right to left, from south to north. Packers handing the ball off for a loss. Picked up on the bounce on a fumble, it will be a touchdown for the Broncos on the first play. Thank you, man. Yeah, yeah. That's my 
Nice touch. Way to pick it up. Way to pick it up. Way to get the ball. is to Clark and he drives to the right side across the 25 out near the 28 another fumble this one's picked up on the far side and returned by Louis Wright Louis Wright's touchdown made the score 14 to nothing with 14 minutes and 23 seconds remaining in the opening quarter and the Packers never recovered heavy Steeler double zone heavy rush As the emotional leader of Denver's opportunistic defense, Tom Jackson was named by his teammates as the Broncos' most inspirational player for the fourth consecutive year. Roland Jones' sack forced a record-setting seventh fumble that sealed the Broncos' 17-14 victory. Reeves said the team was winning ugly, but the Broncos were 6-1 and, and off to their most beautiful start ever. Yeah! Week 8, the Broncos were big news, but it was the injury report written up in Buffalo that worried Reeves. Eight Broncos went down with the most damaging injury to wide receiver Clint Sampson, who was lost for four weeks. A healthy defense responded by cutting off the Bills with six sacks and four interceptions. Aaron Como's theft and linebacker Jim Ryan's sack helped lay the Bills to rest. Elway led the Broncos' offensive attack with two first-half touchdowns. When the injury play kept Elway out in the second half, insurance was provided by Gary Kubiak. finished off the Bills as the Broncos enjoyed their most dominant win of 1984, 37-7. This wave of success continued for the Broncos in Los Angeles, where Kubiak was again at the helm. Against the Raiders and their 91,000 stunned fans, the Broncos had all the right moves as they rallied from a 19-6 deficit with 13 fourth-quarter points. Steve Watson's 12-yard touchdown with 24 seconds remaining sent the game into overtime. Denver's defense once again played a vital role when Mike Harden stripped the ball loose and Steve Foley recovered. The biggest damage was done by safety Roger Jackson, who picked off the Broncos' third interception of the day and set up one of the most dramatic victories in Bronco history. Five seconds left in sudden death. The snap, Carlos's kick is on the way. It is gone! Rich Carlos' 35-yard field goal not only put an end to the game, but it moved the Broncos from a novelty item to top shelf in the AFC West. A healthy John Elway returned as the 8-1 Broncos played host to the Patriots. Mark Cooper and Winford Hood worked well with Brian, Howard, Stuttered, and the rest of the talented offensive line to provide Elway with time to pass for 315 yards. Elway's fourth quarter flip to Butch Johnson brought the Broncos back from a seven-point deficit to tie the game at 19. Watson and Johnson combined for 290 receiving yards and three touchdowns. But with two minutes remaining in the game, it was time for more defensive heroics.
Jonas Smith's touchdown sealed the Broncos' 11th straight mile-high victory, establishing a new franchise record. After posting their third last-minute victory in three weeks, 16-13 in San Diego, the Broncos returned home, where linebacker Rick Dennison helped strip the Vikings' chances of victory. Enjoying his finest day as a pro, Elway threw five touchdown passes to lead the Broncos to a 42-21 victory. Winder, Watson, and Johnson, along with rookie Ray Alexander, were the beneficiaries of Elway's 80% passing performance. Celebrating their 15th consecutive sellout season, Denver's dedicated fans were primed for Week 13's matchup with AFC rival Seattle. A win would give the Broncos a comfortable two-game lead in the division. A loss would tie the clubs for first place. The Broncos and Seahawks both came to stage a shootout. After a quick score silenced the best in the West, the Broncos were left to pound away at a Seahawk lead with the loser going down with guns blazing. In a game that was crammed with phases and stages of suspense, the players and the crowd of nearly 75,000 lived it one play at a time. Gene Lang's second touchdown brought the Broncos to within three points. But with only 39 seconds left in the contest, it was up to the bare right foot of Rich Carlos to send the game into overtime. Ball is down. Carlos's kick is on the way. Hits the goal post and comes back. It is no good. Seattle's 27-24 victory, combined with a loss at Kansas City the following week, forced the Broncos to win their final two games to clinch the division. Good afternoon from the Kingdom in Seattle. This is Bob Martin with Larry Zimmer and the battle for the AFC West Championship. After beating San Diego in their final home game, this much-anticipated rematch at Seattle had the Broncos and the Seahawks tied for first place. In the noisiest stadium in the league, the Broncos swept like surf to the shore and quickly silenced the crowd and pulled under the Seahawks. Watson's 73-yard catch and carry contributed to his third 1,000-yard receiving season, and it opened the way for a flood of Bronco points. Before the first quarter was over, Bronco Man of the Year Rich Carlos added a field goal to give him over 100 points for the first time in his career. Come on, Michael Bailey, right here, Come on. Veteran sack artists Barney Chavis and Reuben Carter, along with youngsters Walt Boyer, Andre Townsend, and Scott Garnett, made the Seahawks their 11th victim to rush for under 100 yards. This wave of success continued with two interceptions that drowned any chance of a Seahawk victory. Here comes the blitz from Robbins. There's the pass, and it's picked off by Foley. Steve Foley will return it for the touchdown. Sammy Winder ran up the second-best single-season rushing total in Bronco history and earned a trip to the Pro Bowl. John Elway scrambled for 43 of his season-high 237 yards and passed for one score. 
Elway finished the season with nearly 2,600 yards passing and 18 touchdowns, while the Broncos finished off the Seahawks with Rick Paris' fourth quarter plunge. The Broncos' victory over the Seahawks was the crowning achievement of an unprecedented season. Their success in 1984 was based on their togetherness. With a cast of solid starters and dependable reserves like Bryson Manor, Glenn Hyde, Marshawn Graves, and Jesse Miles, the Broncos played to the strengths of one another. Their triumphs belonged to an offense that wasn't an illustrious group, but a solid one. And a defense that gave, but also took in a big way. What the Broncos lacked in size, they made up for in heart. And it was with heart that the Denver Broncos became the winners of the West. highlight film is dedicated to the memory of Bronco assistant coach Fran Polesfoot.